Where were we? Okay, so yeah. just since this was finished so recently, we will still be reading from notes. So we apologize uh, we're not about off that. Book yet, as the actors <laughs> say. Um, okay. So yeah. So what does this talk about, Jacob? We are here to share with you guys our favorite, most wonderful things about being creative. And we've narrowed it down to a handy list of eight things. And these things are super positive, super great, and they help us feel better when we're feeling down in the dumps and trying to be creative. So hopefully it'll have the same effect on you guys. Let's look at number one. Let's look at number one. There's always someone better than you. <laughs> Wait, better than, better than me? Better, better than you. Than even me? Even you. That doesn't actually sound like a good thing, Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try. Uh, well, we understand that it's very difficult uh, when you see someone outperforming you, especially when you consider them competition. In fact, when I first met Jacob, I wasn't exactly thrilled that another talented animator was in my arena, so to speak. <laughs> um, and we can demonstrate to you with a little bit of how it kind of went down. Now, when we practice this, by the way, <laughs> we imagine the screen to be behind us, so we're going to need you to use a little bit of imagination. <laughs> okay, here All we right, go. All right, here we go. Oh, uh, hey, that's uh, uh, so cool to have, a, have another animator here at this school where I was the best animator. Yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> uh, so uh, what, you, uh, what you got over there? What you working on? Oh, here. Check it out. Oh, that's, that's cool. Hey. <laughs> Hey, thanks. Yeah, I was, I was trying to think about, like, if this guy, why was he picking up the boxes? Uh -huh. And so if we dive deep into kind of the uh -huh. whole realm about what is going no, yeah, on. Yeah, I think stuff. I get it. That's super cool, man. It's not bad work. I'm going uh, to go uh, work on some animation. Uh, keep up the good work, dude. So cool. See you later. Hey, you too. <laughs> So it, it may be hard to believe, but we had a little bit of rivalry at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, maybe I thought of Jacob as his enemy I had to defeat to get a job. <laughs> really? <laughs> I still do. <laughs> <laughs> but what happened was we were competing against each other so much that we ended up ballooning our short films that we were each working on so much to one-up the other person. Yeah, like I was, I, I was in the eight-month process of creating a 15-minute epic animatic with one month left in the semester. <laughs> and I spent that amount of time just rigging my character, hoping to have a better rig than Tomash. It became super evident that we would not have a short film at the end of the year. <laughs> and we discovered um, that there was a contest for animators going on at SIGGRAPH in 2007. Unfortunately, that contest required three participants to form a team, so we begrudgingly needed to work together. Plus our good friend, friend Jim in the audience right yeah, here. Yeah, Jim! <laughs> so that was us back in 2007. <laughs> Reunion, woo! But that was a whole new experience, working together instead of against each other. Yeah, so to get real with you guys, that was the first time I had, I had experienced a completely new perspective on my friends, essentially. For once, for the first time, when I looked at Jacob's work during that competition and saw that it was amazing, I didn't feel dread. I didn't feel jealousy. I was actually like, hell yeah! This is, that's my boy! This strength is my strength! Our two bodies are one! <laughs> we are two souls intertwined! And I actually felt pride for someone else's work. I realized that J Jacob wasn't and an obstacle for me to get a job. He was a tool <laughs> for me to get a job. He could accelerate and propel me to new heights. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Tom somehow painted it in there at one point that I was the better one, but I, from my perspective, I thought he was the better one, and I was trying to, I felt all the same things that he just described yeah. about him. I was like, yes. He's on my side now, and that's awesome. And feeling like someone who you think is more talented than you needs you is Feels really great. great for your self-confidence yeah. and for your And they your do need you. Game. Just because someone's more talented than you doesn't mean you can't offer them a lot of help. And it doesn't mean that they don't have a lot of shit on their plate, too. Um, but yeah, that experience was great. We ended up winning that contest, you know what I'm saying? Um, and I think the main lesson to take away from it is that both of us hate Jim. 
<laughs> but yeah, but seriously, um, uh, the fact that there's always someone better than you is a great thing because that person is a potential amazing ally that can help you in your life. And you can help them a lot too, as long as you can get past that very human, very natural stab of jealousy that you're always going to feel. I mean, I still right. feel it sometimes with you. Yeah. Like, la like a second ago when you got that laugh, it's like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> and when you're able to invest in someone and help them achieve their goals, then you can start to enjoy their growth instead of fear it. And together, you can learn, which takes us to favorite thing number two. Learning is not fun. Wait, does it really say that? But you drew it. I did. You're right. <laughs> Thanks for going along with that bit. <laughs> There's this perception out there that you need to, as an artist, enjoy every second of what you do. Yeah, when I was in school, I feel like a lot of professionals were like, follow your passion. I enjoy every minute. I haven't worked a day in my life because I love my job. Has that been your experience so far? <laughs> well, let me paint for you. <laughs> A nice story of, of how that actually was really damaging to me, this sentiment, this belief that learning was supposed to be fun. Um, so I became a Pixar intern for animation in 2008. And uh, my expectation was that this was going to be amazing, right? This was going to be so great. And when I started my first animation, I immediately got super frustrated because it wasn't very good. Uh, I got a lot of feedback, and I got really, really, really scared that I was going to blow my chance at Pixar, which, this is another story, but I totally did. <laughs> um, but I was even more scared of letting anybody know that I was getting frustrated, because I thought, well, a good animator loves what they do, so if I'm getting frustrated, I must not be cut out for this. I must not be a good animator. And so I plastered a huge grin on my face, and uh, just started working and pretended I loved it while having successive panic attacks and spiraling into self-loathing. <laughs> and, you know, it would have been amazing for me to hear somebody tell me that, no, learning is not fun, dude. Your, your anxiety, your frustration, that is what being an animator is. That is what being creative is. And that's freaking normal, you know? Oh, man. That is a depressing story. Um, <laughs> so Ira Glass from This American Life talks about uh, this gap. And the gap he describes as, well, learning is the exercise of improving your critical eye so far above your ability that you just look at your work and go, how could it be that bad, that wrong? And if, um, you, if you really want to take a look at this close up, here's a graph of uh, your pain. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not saying that, that learning is bad. Yeah, I mean, look, it says it right up there. Right. See, that's proof. We're not saying learning is bad. It it's says right there learning is good. It's rewarding. It's enriching. enriching. It's good for you. Uh, um, it's just not fun. Yeah, it's just not fun. I mean, for me, I, I kind of think of it like working out, which is another thing I hate. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's good for me, and I need to do it. But I really don't want to, and I really don't like it. I mean, in fact, if I owned a gym, I think my motto or my slogan would be, uh, hey, guys and girls, working out super sucks, so get in here and get it over with. <laughs> <laughs> that won't fit on your sign. <laughs> I can make a big sign. <laughs> so it's really important to keep in mind that learning is not fun because you will run into frustration. And sometimes uh, even, despair. even despair, yeah. We do it all I still the time. do it. Dude, like literally last night at 3 a.m., Jacob is like consoling me, and I'm like, I don't know, this talk sucks, man. We're, we have to cancel it. <laughs> we, can't, we can't do this. And it sounds like I'm doing a bit. It's, no, it's he really, really did not. that. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to laugh now. <laughs> But if you want to be good at something, you can't shy away from the pain, and there's pen plenty there's of... plenty of pain, and that brings us to point number three. Our favorite thing number three, which is that feedback hurts. Oh, man, does it hurt. But I thought feedback was supposed to be really good. 
Yeah, I know. I know. I get it. That's what everybody says. Get some more eyes on your work. Get some more feedback. All feedback's great. Let's just get out there and get some more opinions. But I've just, it's, I've never been good at it. You know, I've just never felt <laughs> like I can receive feedback well. I don't feel like I can give feedback well. And Pe People will say things like, develop a thick skin. Yeah, don't let it bother you. Yeah, uh, don't take it personally. Don't take it personally. Right? But here's the thing, Jacob. I am a large human baby, you know? <laughs> and uh, at this point in my career, it's too late. I'm never gonna have a thick skin. I have really thin, pale, rashy skin. <laughs> and, uh, and when people, it's like, don't take it personally. Oh, sure, the thing that I've devoted my entire life to be good at. Yeah, I'll take it or leave it. <laughs> <laughs> of course it's personal. Of course I'm going to be sad when you don't like my work. Of course I'm going to be happy when you do like it. And why shouldn't I be? Like, right. isn't that what being passionate... Everyone's like, be passionate. Well, I'm being passionate. <laughs> <laughs> but receiving feedback is incredibly valuable, especially the painful, truthful kind. Yes. Um, but while you're receiving it, it's important to remember to share with the people who are giving it to you that you value their opinion and you value their honesty. Yeah, because while it hurts, you can't take it out on the person that's saying it because they're actually helping you while it may be painful. So I know this is yeah. a little abstract, so we're going to demonstrate really quickly uh, how to professionally take feedback uh, in a way that's also uh, emotionally authentic. Right. So let's imagine that I just finished giving Tomas some here. fairly rough feedback. Brutal, let's say. Even. So to sum everything up, I think it just could all be better. I hate you. I just wanted to be done with this. But I really value you. Uh, you are an incredibly valuable friend, and, uh, and I cherish your opinion, and I need you to do this every day. But well, why now? <laughs> why did you have to do it now? And there you have it. Um, <laughs> Now, now you're all ready to go out into the professional world and be back like a pro. <laughs> <laughs> so our point with this one, and to try to wrap this up, <laughs> is that it's okay to be frustrated, and it's okay if it makes you sad, that's normal. And if anything, that's just proof that you care about your work and care about getting better. And feedback, you know, especially the, the painful kind, the honest kind, it needs to be heard. And it needs to be said. And sometimes saying it is even harder than hearing it. Um, which takes which, us to point number four. You are not approachable. You are not approachable. Why do we have this one? <laughs> this one just seems mean. <laughs> <laughs> We're just getting started. So <laughs> it does seem a little bit mean. But to demonstrate this one, we will actually need to get a volunteer from the audience. Oh. We have never taken We've a volunteer before. We've never taken before, a volunteer before. This and be may a never again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you rose. Big. You put your hand up so fast. <laughs> come on up here. <laughs> All right, what's your name? Renee. Renee, everybody. Nice to meet you, Renee. Jacob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. All right, so Renee, uh, thanks for coming up here. Are you enjoying the talk so far? Oh, yeah. She said, yeah, it's great. It's really fun. Jacob. Yeah, you're gonna make me cry, right? So, uh, no, no, no. I, I, I just want to tell Jacob that I've solicited feedback from Renee, and she says it's great. Did you, though? Yeah, like, yeah I just asked her for feedback. Right. You, uh, you asked her a leading question in front of a large group. Of, like, yeah, I, don't, I don't know if that's... Okay, I'm starting <laughs> to see your point. So, it's, uh, it's not highly likely that Renee would give us critical feedback when I put her in front of all of her peers on a stage in the face of probably the only two people in here that have authority currently. <laughs> but we're going to try to turn this around, all right? I'm going to try again. Um, so, Renee, I'm going to need you to really think hard about this, and I need you to come up with what you like least about the talk so far. And I want you to really not hold back. Say it, embellish it. Feel free, because that's going to help us. And frankly, it's also going to make this example work. <laughs> That's a good, that is a... Uh, That's valuable incredibly feedback. Incredibly valid. 
Yeah, so uh, her feedback, which I think is really great, is that uh, I think I blew the speaker earlier. <laughs> and uh, that might have hurt your ears. And, uh, and we're going to adjust that now, actually, and learn from it right away. Everybody give Renee a round of applause. Thank you, We Renee. have a prize for you. <laughs> Woo! There you go. Feedback, feedback hurts, hurts the hardcover edition. <laughs> In addition to me no longer screaming. All right, go ahead. You've been a great... <laughs> yes, thank you for participating. Yay. That's awesome. Watch your step, please. No lawsuits. <laughs> but so, it's yeah. really hard to give honest feedback, even oh. to someone who's super nice. Like, look at me. At that point, I was very unapproachable, right? I wasn't exactly opening the door for criticism um, until I did it the other way, and then I was a pro. <laughs> But no, uh, it can be really, really difficult. Every single person I meet, I am intimidated by. Um, and uh, I want to tell you a story to uh, illustrate my struggles. So uh, a while back, I was complaining at work about this programmer named Chris. And I was complaining at lunch to my friend Brad. And I was telling Brad, Chris does this, Chris does that. It's super frustrating. And Brad's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, so you should go talk to Chris after lunch and tell him this stuff. And I was like, ah, direct confrontation, you're funny. <laughs> He's like, no, really, you, sh you should go. And I'm, like, and I'm like, okay, I think you misread the situation, Brad. <laughs> you thought it was a big deal, but it's not, though. <laughs> it's fine, you know, whatever. And he's like, no, no, you're, it, you need to go talk. You can't just say all this stuff behind his back and then not go say it to his face. And I'm like, what? But everybody else does it. <laughs> Why, do, why are you making me do this? <laughs> um, and I was like, you know what, Brad? If it happens again, I'll totally tell him. Uh, just, you know, not right now. Uh, but Brad wasn't having it. Uh, and Brad is a large person. Uh, and he uh, decided to uh, facilitate the meeting himself. That is to scale. <laughs> uh, uh, and he sat me down. He literally, like, forcibly sat me down in a room with Chris and this is how we started the meeting. He looked at Chris and he said, Chris, Tomash doesn't want to work with you anymore. Tomash? <laughs> and I'm like, ha ha ha. Crazy Brad. <laughs> Funny guy. And I was shaking and my voice was cracking. But eventually I did deliver the feedback to Chris. And you know what? Chris got up and he hugged me and he thanked me. Now, Jacob, I'm not saying that every single direct confrontation is going to end up as wonderful as Chris made it. But I will say that every time I forced myself to do it, no matter how it turned out, I've never had any regrets. And I've always felt a lot better. That's you know? good to know. And if you want to grow fast, you need to get that... Uh, that sense of what you are doing poorly and you have to dig it out of people they won't volunteer it very easily and that's why we think it's really important to keep it in mind that you are not approachable because i guarantee you in all of your lives you are surrounded by people that are frustrated by you and that information of what frustrates them is the key to your success and you need to get it out of them and Actually, you need to dig and you need to also be prepared that when you dig, you are going to get stuff. <laughs> actually, get in long answers. In preparation for this talk, we actually asked of each other, what do you like least about me? And it was very illuminating. <laughs> and maybe later but you can valuable. stop by the booth and ask us about it. <laughs> but no, I think it made, us, it, it made a stronger relationship between us. But you know how we're so sure that there are people, a lot of people in your lives that are frustrated by you? How are we so sure? Well, let's just say it's connected to point number five. Teamwork is frustrating. Hooray. <laughs> but you know, like, isn't teamwork like collaboration and cooperation and everything's always great when that happens? How are we going to spin this into something positive? So know. actually, you'd think that that's true. Does this make you feel Ooh. good? <laughs> uh, if that doesn't create a collective cringe, I don't know what else would. So yeah, that brings up a lot of bad memories, Jacob. <laughs> we saw this post online a while ago that said, uh, when I die, I hope that all the people I did group projects with lower me into my grave so they can let me down one last time. <laughs> and it's really easy to laugh at that. Yeah. 
As if you never did that to somebody else, right? <laughs> we're never the ones that let anybody we're, down. We're very much the perpetrators. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like the fact that there was such a reaction to that is we all resonate with that. The problem is, is that is what teamwork is. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. But you'd think having a lot of talented, creative people would make problem solving easier. Yeah, like, oh, put a bunch of talented people in a room, and that, that's going to that's gonna give us amazing results, right, Jacob? You would think so. There's this joke that goes around work that if you give, ask 10 animators about a shot, you'll get 17 different opinions. <laughs> <laughs> the math checks out on that, actually. But think about it. Think about what a project consists of, right? Walk through this with me. Um, here are all the things that could potentially frustrate me on a project. We got... Poor time management, things not coming in on time. We've got ambiguous goals, no clear direction on what we're supposed to do. The lack of expertise, not knowing how to do things. There could be lots of conflicting opinions in a project. Ranges of work ethics, lots of laziness. There could be scope creep, things ballooning out of proportion. And finally, there's just a ton of tension and anxiety on the line. And all of this is just when I'm working by myself. <laughs> Imagine throwing another person into the mix. Like, here's Jacob. Now it's getting kind of complicated. <laughs> you start to get form a small team, and there's a lot of axes for frustration here. You know? Now you think about an actual professional team, and it's like, oh my god. <laughs> How do we get anything done? Of course, with all of these possible potential threads of miscommunication, there's going to be problems and frustration and people are going to feel like they're not being heard, uh, goals will be misaligned, um, people will feel demotivated. It's almost impossible not to have that. It is like, impossible not to have that. Look at the amount of factors and freaking relationships that are just whizzing around in the cesspool. That one didn't get a laugh. That's a very <laughs> great visual. Thank you. Um, but, but really... What we want to say with teamwork is that keep in mind that it is supposed to be frustrating. Healthy Stuff teams have just as much frustration yeah. as unhealthy teams. The, the only, difference, difference, the only difference really is that healthy teams address it right away, and they're very open about it. If you ask somebody on a healthy team, how's it going, they're going to list out all the problems the team is facing. Versus, you know, someone on a poor team might be too nervous to bring it up, and they're just going to be like, yeah, everything's cool, you know. It's a bunch of chill people. And I'm like, I've never been on a team like that. <laughs> Ever. Not in my favorite times. <laughs> and the thing about the healthy teams, when they talk about their frustrations early and get them out in the open and say, hey, I have a problem with this, they're able to solve those problems faster and actually get to the work of creating something, which, which is, is hard enough. <laughs> yeah, that's hard all by itself. And so let's get into that with our next favorite thing about being creative. You are not original. Holy crap, I thought the other ones were me. <laughs> Why is this one so great, Jacob? Well, if you can release yourself from the clutches of needing to do something original, needing to do something no one's ever seen before, then your work will really improve. Yeah, and I, I mean, I saw this a lot in myself in school. Like, uh, I did this thing that I call I idea cycling or idea loops, where I would like sit there and I would, I would be like, okay, I got an idea. I'm going to draw a freaking orc. Awesome. And I start drawing it. I'm like, yes, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, wait a second. Everybody draws orcs. What was I thinking? I gotta think outside the box. I gotta draw something original. All right, screw this. I'm gonna draw an elf. Yeah. Freaking elf. This is amazing. This isn't even that different. I barely stretched my imagination. You know what? I gotta really think outside the box. Come on. Right, I'm, I'm gonna draw the existential crisis of an artist living in a diverse global populated economy. God damn it, I'm just going to draw an orc. <laughs> See, originality is a barrier. It's not a useful way to approach a problem. It doesn't lead you to great things. There are great things that are original, but there are way more original things that are terrible. Yeah, like, I bet I can think of something original that nobody's ever done right here on this corner of this stage. I could be like... Kicked your water ball on the ground. What you gonna do about it? I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna get it. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. No, that, that was a really good little dance, and it perfectly demonstrated an original thing that was terrible. I thought it was actually okay, which made the example mediocre. <laughs> I'll give it to you. 
<laughs> okay. So let's talk about how you can actually achieve something that's more original. And I think the best way to approach that is through specificity. Oh. Yay. Yay for specificity. So how so, do we do that? How do we do specificity, Jacob? Well, as animators, we tend to think about performance. <laughs> Oh, so yay, let's talk part. about a take or a reaction. Okay. I got so, this. Like this. Okay. That was okay. Let's add some like, you specificity. Know, a basic reaction. It was right? basic. Yeah. Let's add some specificity. Let's add emotion. That's a, a decent way to approach that. Uh, so let's say you're angry about it. Okay. God! God! What is wrong with you? That's pretty good. Okay, so let's add another layer. Um, you're angry about it, and a personality trait, you care about personal appearance. God, oh, come on, man. <laughs> Shit, dude, what's wrong with you? Not the hair, dude. That's good. Acting. Okay, so let's go even further. Let's add some, like, inception-level stuff. How do you feel about how you feel? All right. So now you're angry about it, you care about personal experience, but you're kind of embarrassed about that. You don't want to show it. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> That's good. Okay, now. Okay, I think, let's, I think we're done with this. Is a, we've gone deep enough, Jacob. All this right. is good. He's, let's he's move on. giving his character a goal. That's great. Okay. No, 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 so, no, no. This is not part of the bit. I actually think we should move on now. Okay. You know what? Give, just give me the hammer, all right? Get, get out of here. Okay. Let, we got to... Okay, so what do we mean by originality? We're just going to talk about the... <laughs> He's back to not expecting it. Yeah. You've had your fun. <laughs> <laughs> You're not I a good influence. I think voice just spoke to me. From <laughs> <laughs> but there will be a, there will be a day... <laughs> It will come. <laughs> so yeah, why is it so great to keep in mind that you are not original? Well, well, you're not, and that's fine. You shouldn't try to be. Yeah. You should try to be specific. And then you'll find some originality through that sometimes. It's that's, not a foolproof yeah, method. Yeah, it's not foolproof. I mean, most of the things you make are still going to be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> you will make a lot of terrible stuff. Um, and, and that's okay. You should expect to do that. There will be a yep. lot of failures. Yep. And that brings us to favorite thing about creativity, number seven. Failure defines you. Ooh, that's bleak. <laughs> it is bleak, but I think it can give you some courage. Failure is an interesting topic. I think uh, as an innovative industry, we talk about it a lot. And I think we've come to, come to expect that failure is a necessary part of taking risks and doing innovative things. It, there's been a lot of like slogans that come up like, yeah, celebrate, celebrate failure. failure. Make this environment safe to fail. You know, and you can tell by the way I'm saying this that I don't resonate much with these. Um, I don't think this is really the right way to talk about it. And mostly because when you actually fail, it is awful. It is a gut-wrenching, yeah. awful thing. It's like, if I like trip and I go, ugh, then it's like, yeah, I'll celebrate failure, oopsies. But if I ruin my friendship with Jacob, if I say something that makes him never speak to me again, it's not like, yay, celebrate failure. <laughs> <laughs> I have one less friend. <laughs> Time to learn from it. <laughs> <laughs> but let's talk about someone else's failure instead, please. So I, I have a story. <clears throat> it was a really interesting uh, experience I had where I, I went to this presentation where a lady was giving a, uh, talking about her college and kind of selling it to a bunch of students. And she was not winning over the audience. Most of them were like, mm, not paying attention to her at all. And she put on this video. And uh, unfortunately, and man, I felt bad for her because this has happened to me. Fortunately, the video, the audio kept cutting out. Half of it was muted and... And, uh, if that Who knows was, what that's like? Yeah, woo, yay, technology <laughs> failure. And like, it, as if that wasn't bad enough, uh, she didn't handle it particularly well. Um, she just kept going, uh, normally there's sound during this. Do you, do you know how to, do you know what's, uh, uh, and, and like, oh man, it was so hard to watch. But that's not the point I'm trying to make. 
The point I'm trying to make is every eyeball in that room was glued to her. For the first time during her presentation, she had the undivided attention of every single person in that room. And that's what we mean when we talk about failure. It is awful, but it's also a spotlight for you. And you can choose if you have the clarity and presence of mind to utilize that spotlight as an opportunity rather than a huge cringeworthy mess, right? And Jacob has a good story of that. There was this time where we were in a meeting with Jeffrey Katzenberg, the CEO of DreamWorks, watching the film, and he wanted to point out a part of the film that he thought we were failing the character. Um, that the, the moment we were displaying was not truthful to who the character was. And so out of the entire scope of this two-hour movie, he kind of narrowed it down to this sequence and this shot and this moment. And so that's where we're now not being truthful. imagine that's your shot. The, the freaking CEO just took the whole movie and went right there. That's the part that's ruining it. Like a sniper. <laughs> so the, the entire room was the animation department. Jeffrey didn't know who animated the shot, but everyone else in the room did. And so all the heads just turned right to him. Yeah. Spotlight, boom. And the way he handled it was just he looked up and went, that was me? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it seems like a small thing, but there was, there's a billion other ways he might have reacted. He could have been like, Ugh. he could have just... There are a number you know, of ways they could have made the rest of the room cringe instead yeah, of kind of laugh at him. Super like, ugh, unfortunate. But instead, he took that opportunity to be self-deprecating, to be able to laugh at himself, and to def diffuse the tension. And look at that, Jacob has remembered that. I mean, I'm gonna remember that forever about this person who I don't even know. Because that's the kind of effect failure and these high anxiety stress moments have. And, you know, you can see it as an opportunity through that gut-wrenching, uh, feeling and possibly make it at least less of a mess, if not an amazing demonstration of who you are. Right, and you cannot avoid failure. It will happen to everybody here a lot. Yeah. You will often feel like there's nothing you could have done, like it wasn't your fault, which brings us to our next point. It definitely was your fault. <laughs> <laughs> so why is this a great thing about creativity? So... I, d I don't mean this quite so literally, right? Uh, it, I'm not trying to say literally everything in the world is your fault. It is, however, a highly effective way, um, a, a mode of thinking, a, a lens that you can use to assess a problem uh, that helps you grow and learn a lot faster. There's something that a lot of us say, I'm sure all of you have said it, is that I didn't finish that project or task because I ran out of time. Yeah, and that might even be true. There might have been some crazy event that prevented you from finishing the project and not having enough time. But the problem with that is that you're disassociating yourself from any sort of responsibility. Yeah, and I mean, like, ultimately, there are a lot of other ways I can frame that where you're, like, center, front and center in terms of accountability. Because really, you could say it as like, I didn't finish this project because I didn't choose a project that was within the scope of the time I had. I didn't finish this project because I failed to prioritize at all. I didn't finish this project because I didn't manage my time, <laughs> right? And those kind of things will help actually make changes in your life. You can actually start thinking about, well, what can I do differently next time? I can maybe scope down my next project. Maybe I can budget more time for my next project. Whereas the other way doesn't necessarily facilitate you to change anything, and you'll probably just do it again. Um, Run out of time again. And you might come back at me and be like, well, no, this was seriously not my fault. Like, literally, my relative was in a deathbed, and I had to fly across the country, and so I was gone for a week. And I could still say, well, why didn't you choose a project or plan a project that was resilient to unexpected scheduling changes? How could you possibly do that? What sort of project <laughs> is resilient to unexpected scheduling I changes? I got lots of them, but I'll share one with you just so it's not so abstract. You could make a collection of walk cycles. If you get at least three done, it doesn't matter when you're interrupted. <laughs> it's done now. It is a collection of walk cycles. <laughs> I meant to do 30, and I did two and a half. And that one just stutter steps, but it still counts. <laughs> I but feel yeah. like when you're a student, you're, you're constantly making excuses like, well, 
or at least looking to the future and saying, when I'm at a studio, everything will work. The rig will work, the tools will work, my computer won't crash. Every professional in here is like, ha, ha, ha! <laughs> <laughs> but really, like, I was very much like this. Um, as a student, I feel like I was always waiting for all the obstacles to get out of my way, finally, so that my talent could shine. But now, as a professional of a couple years, I've learned that real talent is being able to shine with tons of obstacles in your path. Um, because they're always going to be there. And now, we will read two rhymes. So first, we have a rhyme about Joe. <clears throat> These are fictitious people. <laughs> Joe wants to be an artist, but his art school sucks. For 50,000 bucks, that place should be deluxe. Joe wants to learn to draw, but no one there can teach him. There's awesome artists out there, but none of them can reach him. He applied for a job, but they lost his application. He emailed the recruiter, but she said she's on vacation. He gets one interview, but his car breaks down. All he ever wanted was to leave this town. Now his dream job needs five years' experience? Five whole years? Are they really freaking serious? Joe's gripes are legit. Joe's life isn't fair. He sits and feels a mixture of outrage and despair. Poor freaking Joe, you know? But now we have a rhyme about Jill. Jill wants to be an artist, but her art school blows. So Jill finds an online school that has some working pros. Jill wants to learn to draw, but there's no class for that. So Jill just draws a thousand freaking drawings of her cat. She applies for a job, but she doesn't get a call, so she finds 10 more studios and applies to them all. She gets one interview, but her car breaks down, so she Skypes them from the library in her hometown. They were looking for experience. She's not sure what to say, but her drawings are so good, Jill gets hired anyway. Lots of things aren't fair. Jill knows that to be true, but she ain't got time to dwell on it. Jill's got shit to do. <laughs> so yeah, so that's, I think, it's, this is a particularly effective way to frame yourself in your own life. Now I'm not trying to say like, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Like, the, the excuses in your life are, are real. Like, there are people in this room that are gonna have to face hardships that I couldn't even imagine. Life isn't fair. Some of us are gonna have to struggle a lot more than others. The problem is, no matter how valid the excuse, your work still ain't getting done, right? And so you have to find a way. You're the only one that's gonna make it happen if you want something. And the sooner you kind of understand that life isn't fair, then just try to get to the overcoming that part. Because you're the best person to know how to over overcome those challenges you're facing at the moment. Because you're the, the, you got the front seat of your own life. <laughs> So what we want to do is we want to give you guys a permission, permission essentially, to get up and do the thing that you want to do. And if you don't have the tools, make them. Find them. Find another way. If you want to make films, make one. And if it sucks, make another one. Whatever it is that drives you, find a way to do it. Make time in your life for it. Make time for it every day. And don't let anybody stop you. And don't let your excuses, especially the valid ones, get in your way. Uh, Stephen King also says, uh, you know, very eloquently, you can, you should, and if you're brave enough, you will. But I actually like the other quote even more. <laughs> Amateurs wait for inspiration. The rest of us just get up and go to work. So get so. to work. Woo! That's it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. You guys are so nice. I feel, oh my God, I feel so much better right now.